And before I talk about mindful meditation, mindfulness meditation, Buddhist awareness practice, continuity of present moment awareness, yeah, we talk about it in different ways. It's always good just to do a little practice and just notice how we get a little tight. Okay, now I'm going to be aware. <laughs> but it, one of the first things we discover and kind of the first invitation is not to be aware, but to notice right now that the mind is already aware, right? Isn't the, isn't the mind or the heart already knowing? So what is the mind knowing? And you can close your eyes or you can keep your eyes open. What's the mind knowing? Can we just leave that experience alone? In other words, can we be aware of whatever we're aware of without needing to fix or control? And just contemplate that simple question. Okay, there's a sensitive heart, a knowing mind. There's awareness here. Is it possible to be aware and just to allow the experience to be or the experiences to be? And even if you're noticing a lot of resistance or controlling or tightness, well, can that just be allowed to be the way it is? What's that like? And is it possible as we're noticing the sensitivity, the awareness, what would it be like now just to be relating to whatever it is that is being known, to be relating with kindness? So if you're feeling your body sitting and the whole range of physical sensations of sitting. Well, what would it be like just to be kind? Relating to the present moment in a kind way. Just exploring that possibility. And explore this quality of alertness or interest, curiosity. So we're not interested in something particular, but we're interested in the present moment being known, being felt, whatever that might, whatever that experience might be now. And just see if you can invite the awareness, the attention to notice all the different subtle and not so subtle sensations in the head and face. For example, can you feel now the weight of the hair at the top of the head? And those of you without much hair, can you feel the air touching the skin or the temperature. Noticing any sensations of the ears. Simply opening to the brow and the forehead. And if there's any tension here, just Noticing that without judgment, we're not directly trying to fix anything. Notice if there's any tension in the eyes. Feel the air touching the skin of the face. 
Is it cool or warm? Can you actually feel the current of air at the nostrils as the breath goes in, as the breath goes out? And can you notice that breathing, the current of air touching without needing to control the breathing process, but just allow the body to breathe. Notice any tension in the jaw. Notice the moisture, the wetness of the mouth. Simply notice without judgment if the lips are touching or slightly apart. So in a way we're relearning how to be present, how to be intimate. And we're just training with something simple like being aware of the head and face as it actually is. And of course, the sensations here in the face and head, they're not static, they're changing. Notice that changing quality of these sensations and qualities. We're gonna do a simple body scan. It's one of the techniques we'll use from time to time during the course. We'll go a little bit more quickly, but Next, we're simply open to all the sensations in the throat and neck, including the back of the neck. And we're using this receptive presence. So you don't have to so much direct your attention, but just be interested to receive whatever is being felt in the throat, the sides of the neck, back of the neck. And again, can we allow these sensations to be the way they are? Yeah. And make sure you have a cushion that fits your body. There's extras in the corner if that doesn't work. And again, we're just, as we go through each part of the body, we're learning how to be both present and relaxed, allowing the throat and neck to be the way it is. When you're ready, just let the awareness, the attention connect with the tops of the shoulders and the shoulder joints. In a way, we're letting the awareness soak in or we're stabilizing this attentiveness to the shoulders just as they are. And we're not trying to make anything happen, just trying to be present to the reality of the shoulders and allowing everything to be the way it is. And if there is some unpleasant sensations here, we just learn to be okay about what's being felt. Learn how to soften and allow tightness to be tightness, if that's what you're feeling. And notice all the ordinary sensations, like as we move down the upper arms now, you can just feel the cloth uh, of your sleeve, shirt or whatever, touching the skin of your bicep or underarm. We feel the bend of the elbow, whatever that's like, forearms. And maybe feel the air touching the back of the hands. Feel the vibration, the warmth 
the contact in the hands and fingers. And a lot of what we learn initially in our mindful awareness practice is how to be interested in what is essentially neutral or ordinary. So this is a good training just to be aware of both arms and both hands. Probably for us, it's a pretty ordinary or neutral experience. But see if you can connect and sustain awareness in the arms and hands and simply feel what you feel. So in a way we're practicing not forgetting the object of awareness, in this case, the arms and hands. The full range of sensation here, just as it is. Take our time, we'll move down the torso. So from the neck and throat, we move into the upper chest and upper back and simply receive whatever sensations are here now. Remember this receptive or open mode of awareness. It's almost as if we're listening. Listening is often a more receptive sense. So we're as if we're listening to the sensations in the upper chest and upper back. Beginning to feel the structure of the rib cage and places of tension. And again, feeling the clothes against the skin in the chest and upper back. Shoulder blades and the space between the shoulder blades. And some folks might feel that more subtle expansion and contraction of the rib cage and the lungs, or even the subtle beating of the heart deep in the chest. And your mind might just naturally visualize, but remember we're using the actual sensations as the primary object of awareness. What does it feel like here in the chest and upper back? The steady, relaxed presence. And eventually dropping a little further down to the solar plexus in the middle of the back, the kidney areas. Feel the spine or sense the upper half of the spine right to the base of the skull. Feel that soft quality of the solar plexus and how it moves the diaphragm. There's a gentle rising and falling following the breath. Being present, but at the same time, just trusting the body to be the way it is. We're not being parental, we're not trying to fix stuff. And then letting the attention drop down into the belly and the lower back. And again, not judging, not complaining. We're developing this, you could call it a mental muscle to be open and receptive, alert and relaxed. And we're training now by simply receiving the sensations in the abdomen and lower back, just as they are.
in a fresh way, as if this is the very first time. Right down, feeling the structure of the pelvis, the groin, the sits bones, the floor of the pelvis. Feeling things just as they are here at the base of the torso. And we'll take a few moments and feel open to the entire upper half of the body from the base of the pelvis to the top of the head. Front side, back side. Open. Allowing things to be the way they are here. And then from the hip sockets, just being curious, alert and relaxed as we feel both thighs. Notice the obvious touch points. For example, if the hands are touching the thighs, just notice that experience of contact. pressure, whatever, even the ordinary or subtle experience of the slacks against the skin and the bend of the knees and the shins and the calves just as they are. Notice the ankles, you might even feel the socks against the skin, all the way down to the heels. And the sides and tops of the feet. Feeling all the toes just as they are. Bottoms of the feet. And feeling the whole body together. And remember with this receptive, observing quality of the mind, we don't have to go looking for the body. It just naturally arrives right here in the sensitive heart, sensitive mind. Isn't that true? To be aware of the body, do we have to go to it? Or is the sensations, do they already show up right here in the knowing mind, sensitive heart? And then the interesting question to contemplate is, can we leave these sensations alone? Just allow, just relax and allow things to be the way they are. So just explore that for maybe two minutes of silence, being aware of the whole body sitting, but explore if you can just leave it alone, like be intimate, present, but not having any agenda except to be present. Just do the best you can. Keeping the sensations of the whole body and mind. 
and letting them be. This is a beautiful willingness to be exposed to the sensations of the body, not in conflict with the sensations of the body. You could even say an unconditional surrender to the body. And just notice what that's like, this relatively stable presence with the experience of sitting, the body sitting is like this. And there's one more reflection I'd like you to experiment with for just another minute or so. As we're just sitting aware of the body, just check in your own mind, your own heart, can you stop being aware? Is there an off button? Really check. Is awareness something you do and then you stop doing? Or is awareness sort of natural to the mind, inherent to the mind? Just check. And if you think you're the one who does the knowing, does the awareness, then stop being aware. See how that works. Just exploring the nature of the mind. So when you feel ready, and allow your eyes to open. Notice how that was for you. You sat for about 25 minutes. You can stretch your body a little if you need to. So really good to see everybody tonight, everyone comfortable, both at home and here in the center. Got what you need. Hey, would you mind shutting the light off in the closet? It's right on the side, thanks. So great to have people back in the building and great to have all of you folks on Zoom. We have about 31 looks like on Zoom and maybe around 25 in the room here. And my name's Mark Nunberg and the, one of the guiding teachers at the center and we've been doing these intro classes since 1993, so a long time. And Common Ground is, uh, if you don't know, is a Buddhist med meditation center. So we're learning mindfulness in the context of the Buddhist teachings. And, you know, nowadays mindfulness meditation is everywhere because it's, it's like the I think it's fair to say the most astounding thing in the world. There are a lot of astounding things, but I think the most astounding thing is that all of us, we have a mind, but how much time have we devoted to studying our own mind? And some of you might be psychology majors or even psychologists or whatever, but you're not really studying your mind. You're studying some, you know, abstract or, general mind, but to use awareness to turn inward and to study the mind. 
And I know it makes us a little uncomfortable. I mean, that's, that's a telltale sign that when we talk about looking inward, one of the first emotional responses is we feel a little self-conscious, like, I don't think I'm supposed to look in there. Do you know that feeling? It's like, which is so bizarre, really, that like, because, you know, given that we're human beings, being aware, having a mind that is aware is kind of fundamental <laughs> to being a human being. I mean, we've studied our toenails, you know, and we've been obsessive about so many seemingly insignificant things in life. And yet the most relevant thing, we've been kind of dismissive and, and even, I think it's fair to say, a little frightened about the mind and awareness. A little bit like that uh, scene from The Wizard of Oz, like paying no attention to the guy behind the curtain. You know, it's sort of like, there's sort of built-in warning signs, like, no, no, later, you'll do that later. Or all that's relevant is out here. And, you know, we stay busy with the outside world, but somehow you all got here on Zoom, in the room. And often what gets us to mindfulness meditation or just a, a more systematic, intentional looking, using our heart, using our mind. In Buddhism, heart, mind, chitta, it's the same. So we're using what is sensitive mind, heart, to study the mind. Or you could say study the self or study this. I'll just give you a little thing right now, a little reflection. That's a, it can be a little trippy, but it will help you understand, you know, when we practice mindfulness, we're really being, we're cultivating mindful awareness, present moment awareness in order to study the mind. And then it kind of begs the question, well, what is the mind? And, you know, within the context of Buddhist awareness practice, we have an answer. This is the mind. Because whatever you're doing right now, like seeing me or hearing me or thinking about what I'm saying or feeling your aching knee or wondering what's in the fridge, you know, so it doesn't matter what you're doing right now, but whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, where is that experience being known? Here and now in the mind. <laughs> so whether we've known it or not, we've only had experiences of the mind. Every single experience we've ever had is something being known here and now. And here and now is always the mind, that's the only place where knowing happens. That's kind of what we mean by the mind. Where the experience that is being known is being known. Are you okay with that definition of the heart? Whatever is being felt, sensed, is here and now. And that here and now, doesn't it seem okay to call that mind or heart? The nice thing about that, we don't need to align with neuroscience, but that sort of aligns with neuroscience, you know, right? They, they don't really understand science, you know, Western scientists don't understand consciousness, but they just presume, you know, it happens somehow in the, in the physical brain or in the nervous system, but we don't have to go there. We just know that there's knowing, there's sensitivity and we're deciding as a group just to be on the same page, we'll call that the mind or mind or the heart. And that whatever experience we have, that's, it really comes down to this experience is being known. So again, just to kind of lay the ground for work for the work we'll do these next six weeks, we're going to be reducing our subjective experience as a human being to, in any given moment, it's something is being known. 
It's never more complicated than that. And I, and I really, this is sort of homework during your formal sitting time. Hopefully everyone will be able to put aside at least a little time every day. Five minutes is better than no time. Ideally, you, you know, would do 20 to 40 minutes a day. That would be great, but it's gonna be what it's gonna be. And even if you're naughty and don't sit at all, there's always the next day or even a short sit there in your bed with your pajamas on. And then you only then you realize, oh my God, I'm doing this six week introduction to mindfulness meditation and I didn't sit. Well, just do your practice right there in bed. Because the formal sitting time is just creating conditions that are relatively simple because it's so easy for our mind to get swept away by our thoughts about this and that, our thoughts about life, that you know the day begins and pretty soon the day's over. And there was not a moment for the mind to go, oh yeah, sit down in a comfortable, upright way. And notice I don't have to do anything. Awareness is there. Can I notice what the mind is knowing? Can I know or observe what the mind is knowing? Can I keep the present moment in mind? The present moment, I, so this is a quiz. I told you a few moments ago, our present moment as a human being is always two things. Something is being known. And you can't really distinguish that very well. So don't try like, is this the object? that's being known, or is this the knowing that's knowing the object? But the present moment is always this. You look at the present moment from this angle and it's, oh, something is being known. And you look at it from this angle and you go, oh, sound is being known, or thinking is being known, or sensations are being felt, or, right? So there's an object and awareness, and that's always our experience as a human being, and we say that happens in the mind, that the something being known is happening in the heart or mind. Everybody with me? With me enough? <laughs> and our practice is like to notice that and to practice being, and this is this last thing you have to remember, alert and relaxed or interested and relaxed. Can you remember those two things? So. As long as you remember there's a mind and in that mind, there's always something being known. And my job as a meditator is to be curious, interested, alert and relaxed with it. That's all. And part of being relaxed is just giving it permission to be what it is, to allow it. Like we played a little bit with that in the opening set where we were just going through the body which is one of the meditation techniques you can use because it's pretty easy to remember, oh yeah, there's the top. Or you can begin at the bottom, head, <laughs> you know, and then something being known, right? Sensations being known, whether you're feeling the head and face as one thing or paying attention to specific areas in the head and face, the object doesn't matter. We're just using these different experiences we have as human beings to cultivate this relaxed and alert attention to the present moment, which is what? What's the present moment? Something being known. That's it. It's so easy, but it's going to be really, really hard. Why do you think it's going to be really hard? Because we're used to thinking about stuff. Like uh, somebody asked one of the great elders of the last uh, century that sort of um, partly responsible for Buddhism, this style of Buddhism, we call this early Buddhism, this lineage or Theravada Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism you'd find in Thailand and Myanmar, or Burma and uh, Sri Lanka and Cambodia and Laos, Southeast Asia. And then here in the West, more often we call it early Buddhism or uh, Vipassana or insight meditation. 
So Common Ground would be an insight meditation center. And, and um, you know, so we're, we're trying to keep the present moment in mind in a relaxed and alert way, right? like curious. And we're kind of hitting that same note, keeping the present moment in mind. The present moment is always something being known. And we'll use different objects or anchors or meditation objects to do this training. But sometimes we do more of an open awareness, like you will probably have to practice when you do this all day long. Because the idea isn't just to do 20 minutes a day. We do the 20 minutes a day. So we make it more likely that we'll be present all day long. So the formal time when you're creating optimal conditions because your cell phone is off and the people you live with know to leave you alone and you've trained your dog or cat to be asleep in the corner or in another room, right? And you're in a uncluttered little corner of your home if you can, so you don't have too many distractions like a stack of bills that you need to pay right in front of you, right? You're just looking out a window or you have a nice altar or plant or whatever is simple and not activating for you. And you sit there because it's optimal conditions. You've got a comfortable chair, a comfortable cushion, comfortable enough. And you're sitting in a way that matches what you're trying to do. You're sitting in a relaxed and alert way physically. So that will support what we're trying to do with our heart and mind, which is to be relaxed and alert with the present moment, which is something being known. So just to check that you get like the practices, we all have a mind right now and something is being known moment by moment. So what's the mind knowing now? Just check. And, and just with some continuity, just track that there's knowing, knowing experience. And if self-consciousness gets to be one of the predominant things, then just notice that self-consciousness is being known or being felt. And you might like, partly because of the self-consciousness, you might just stare at the floor and then notice, oh yeah, seeing is being known. And if there's some tension in the eyes, oh yeah, tension is being felt. Can I be relaxed and alert? Relax means allowing, trusting, softening, being receptive. And alert means just that authentic interest, which usually means humility. Because if I think I know what the present moment is, I'm not really alert. I'm sort of trying to make the present moment fit my idea. That's often one of the hardest things is we're trying to make something happen. But what we're trying to have happen is a deeper recognition of the way it is. We're trying to see things as they are. So if we're a naturalist out in a new environment, world famous naturalist, you know, we've heard stories about this particular environment and the creatures that live here and the plants. But a really good naturalist tries to forget all of that and just pay attention and sort of allow what's there in the environment to reveal itself. So they you know, they become very alert and relaxed. If they're not relaxed, their alertness, their interest is distorted by the tension, by the agenda, the expectation, right? But if we're really relaxed, but also alert. And interestingly, we tend to think, you know, I can do one or the other, but I can't really do both. So tell me what to do. Do you want me to be relaxed? I can be relaxed, but then I get a little dull and sleepy. Or you want me to be alert? I can do alert, but then I get hypervigilant and tight. And I got agendas. Like I'm alert because I want something to happen. I want to make something happen. I want to figure something out. I want to problem solve. 
but you'll see that they actually really complement each other. And this is the basic attitude we want to cultivate our whole life long. Wouldn't it be nice to move through life at all times, being at ease, relaxed, and clear, open, alert, interested. That'd be a nice way to move through life. We'd become more and more competent at everything we do if we operated in that alert and relaxed manner. And so with that alert and relaxed manner, it's subtle, but we're trying to hit a particular note, which is, this is being known. And you can either direct your attention, either both in a sit and in daily life, you can come back to your breath. Oh yeah, breathing in is being known. Breathing out is being known. Or you can come back to hearing, or you can come back to just generally the physicality of whatever the body's doing, standing, sitting, lying down, reaching, bending, turning. Oh yeah. Turning is being known. Sitting is being known. Pain in the knee is being felt. It's amazing. Uh, we don't realize it, but this experience of something being known is really limited to these six sense gates. You know, we all know the five physical senses. Hearing is being known. Smelling and tasting, unless we're eating, you know, it's not that predominant. But even now, there's a little experience of smelling and tasting. It's neutral, like tasting the saliva in our mouth. Most of us, it's neutral, right? But it's still a taste. Hopefully, the smell in the room is pretty neutral. But it's still an experience being known, isn't it? But we tend to be oblivious with neutrality. But one of the things I mentioned in the guided sit, we're going to learn to be attentive to even things that are neutral and ordinary. It's part of the alertness, developing that muscle of alertness. And then we have, I forget where I left off, but hearing and touching maybe, right? So you know the five physical senses. And then everything else, whatever else you experience, we call mental activity. Motion, thought, mental images. And there's really never any, not really, there isn't anything else we know. We know these, we know the world through these six sense gates. So Buddhism just adds the activity of the mind because we can know thought, mental image, emotion, right? So it's a sense gate. It's a way that the mind is sensitive because we can be sensitive to mental activity. And we can make us sensitive to sound and touch and smell and taste and hearing. Just those six things. So besides just some specific techniques, I've said almost everything we need to know. We're cultivating the continuity of present moment awareness, or we're cultivating the continuity of this present moment awareness in a way is the same as saying being aware of the mind and the mind is something being known and we're relating to that learning how to relate to that in a relaxed and alert way and the interesting thing i mean we could call it a kind of soft power but you know what the buddha taught and what people these 2,500 years, I put myself in this place. What we learn is life transforming. And I know it sounds a little weird to say, being mindfully aware changed your life. <laughs> it sounds like a joke almost. And you didn't have to pay for that, <laughs> you know, because it doesn't, you don't need specialized equipment. You don't even need that much information but you do have to practice. Oh, I think I don't forget, forget if I mentioned, so I, I started to say like this famous uh, 
teacher of the last century, Asian teacher from Thailand said, you know, when someone asked like, what's the basic problem? He said, well, we're all lost in thought. Like that's how we care. That's the honest way to characterize. Like if you look back on today and just want to sum up what happened today, the quick and dirty to sum up, quick and dirty way to su summarize it is I was lost in thought. I was lost in this thought. And I got bored with that thought. And my mind generated another thought and got lost in it. And what I mean by lost in thought is there's thinking and there's no present moment awareness that thinking is being known. Like I can ask you all to think the thought, spring starts in a couple of weeks. And you can, you know, repeat that thought a few times. And you can notice thinking as a present moment phenomena, can't we? Right? Thinking can be known in, in that reflective way. Oh, the mind's thinking about spring coming in a couple of weeks. And it's like this. Now, you don't need to say what I just said, but I'm sort of describing the mind, the knowing mind can be aware of this sense gate we call mental activity. But how many times today were you aware that you were thinking the thoughts that you were thinking? Honestly, <laughs> maybe a couple times, but yet most of the day was filled with thinking, but there was none of that reflective knowing, oh, I'm thinking this, these thoughts are coming and going in my mind. Oh, here I go thinking this thought for the 23rd time. Right? Oh, it's like this again. How much of that reflective, spacious, honest, non-judging, mindful awareness was there? That means if you, if you can't say, oh yeah, there was a lot of that, that means most of the day we were lost in thought. There was thinking, but no wise awareness that thinking was happening. And that should kind of break our hearts a little bit because that means we're living a life, but we're unaware. We're sort of like on autopilot. Because you know how it is when we're thinking things from within the bubble of the content that we're thinking, it always feels like there's an agent in charge doing the thinking. But when we have more mindful awareness around our mental activity, we realize these are just established patterns playing themselves out. You know, even like those of you who are living with someone that you've been living with for a long time, whether it's a kid or a partner or whatever it might be. Do you notice that the conversations and the way of interacting, it's sort of like been here, done this. I mean, it may be slightly different tonight than it was last night or five minutes ago, but there are these repeating patterns. So what we're adding to this, you know, being zombies or an autopilot through our lives, we're just bringing, cultivating this, let's call it a mental muscle just to be present, which is an awareness that this is being known, an awareness of what's being known. Oh yeah, this is being known, now it's like this. So let's just try that for a minute. You know, we're sitting, you can have your eyes open or closed. If you're open, just gaze down toward the floor so you're less distracted by what might be going on around you. And in your own way, just establish that this experience, let's say the physicality of sitting is being known. Sitting is being known. And you can even use that phrase if you need that kind of anchor and then just on your own, see if you can sustain a present moment awareness of whatever the mind is knowing.
So I'm going to see if there are any questions or even a response to how that was. Just looking at what gets in the way of continuity. Why is it so hard for us humans to sustain present moment awareness? Normalizes what it is to have a mind, right? It's just like all over the place. And then in being all over the place, one of the chronic habits of our conditioned mind or our habit bound mind is to judge itself. I mean, not just itself, we judge everything. Right? Just, that's what the mind does. And then that sets in motion the doubt that Nolan mentioned. Now here's an important question. Was the wandering mind or the doubting mind or the judging mind an inherent problem in the way that we're just beginning to understand practice? No, because it's still something being known. And our job is to be aware of that in a relaxed and alert way. Oh, look at that, judging. Look at that, the spinning of doubt. Look at that, the mind flitting around, noticing silly stuff. Yeah, so the person for people online, in case you didn't hear, the person was asking, like, when some doubt comes up, do you address it or do you let it go? And this is really the hard part of the practice because it's so simple. We try to notice that mental activity, let's call it doubt, as something being known. And we try to relate to it in a relaxed, non-judging, and alert, curious, like that's an interesting phenomena. It's doubt being known. And it will pass away on its own, right? Otherwise there'd be an incredible tra traffic jam in our minds if thoughts didn't come and go. Emotions come and go. We hardly ever notice that they go away, but they're always going away. Otherwise there'd be no space for the next thought or emotion or feeling or whatever. So notice that they go away. Instead of thinking, I have to make it go away, just be aware, aware in this relaxed and alert way. Oh, look at that. There was a little storm, a little drama, and then it's went away. How many kind of internal psychological, emotional dramas did we have today? I mean, honestly, it's hundreds, right? I mean, if you counted the little ones, maybe even thousands, They've all arose and left. Did you have to do that? Did anybody have to? No, they just did that. That's what I mean. Like when we really start studying the mind in this way, we see how impersonal it is. One of my teachers, a Burmese monk, uh, Saida Utejaniya, someone I've studied with in different ways for quite a while now. But, uh, you know, he, he, one of his pithy phrases is, this activity of the mind that we're talking about, it's not personal, but we're still responsible to be skillful with it, not to control it or fix it, but to relate to it wisely. And wisely means we're alert and relaxed. Relaxed means we're not judging it. We're just allowing it to be nature. This is the nature of the habit mind, the conditioned mind. And, but I wanna see it for what it is. Because the more we see it clearly and the more we realize, I didn't do that. No one did that. That's just a thought coming up or a tendency arising because of the way the spine has been conditioned. That's true with our, the good stuff, the sort of skillful qualities of our mind. It's true with the not so skillful qualities. And again, I just want to point out um, the two people that made comments, how useful it is. And in the weeks ahead, remembering, even taking a note so you remember and bringing it back, your questions and your experiences will benefit everybody. And even more than what I say to you based on your comment or question will be just the cumulative effect of hearing people say things about their mind and their practice that it will be really solid gold 
in terms of under, deepening our own understanding of our mind. Because the, the mind we're talking about is sort of more subtle and fundamental than your particular conditioning and my particular conditioning. I mean, we, we see a lot of my personal conditioning, but we're really getting to know how things come and go more than the particular attitude that is there because of my particular parents or the culture that I was conditioned by. We're really talking about more fundamental aspects of our own mind and heart. So if there's nothing more, then let's stand. And while we're just standing and relieving any tension you might have from sitting, um, I just wanna mention that in the email that I've been sending out, there's a link to all the handouts for the course. So please take a look at those handouts. And one of them is for walking meditation practice. It's probably like week three or something but it's good to read that sooner because for some of you, just nature of your body, mind, and your, what's going on in your life, doing some walking meditation might work actually better than sitting, or you might split it up and you might do a little sitting in the morning, but then do some walking practice. And especially if you're kind of a more wound up person, or you just tend to be more on the hyper side, you might just find a hallway or maybe you got a place outside and I'll talk more about it in the weeks ahead, but the instructions will be useful. And you're just the Buddha taught to be mindful in all four postures, sitting, lying down, walking and standing, right? And uh, it's really good to experiment with all four postures all day long. But for formal time, I would just initially stick with the three. And we'll talk about lying down practice a little later in the course. Standing, if you're really sleepy, it might be better to stand with the knees a little bent, just in a relaxed way. It's an excellent posture for mindfulness or meditation practice, is if you're really sleepy. And then uh, walking can be really good if you just have a lot of energy. You might start at a kind of relatively normal pace, but as you settle in, you might naturally go to a, a slower walk. You know, in a perfect world, you'd have a hallway that's whatever this is, 40 feet long, but even 12 feet will be enough. Like if you have a hallway in your home that's uncluttered, so you're not getting triggered by what you see, you know, and thinking and thinking about that. Um, or outside, and if nothing works, even like three times around the block. But it's nice not to have to think about where you're walking. The advantage of having a walking lane, and that's if you went to the monasteries in Asia, and I practiced in both Burma and Thailand at the monasteries, some of the monasteries there, every little kuti or little cabin, but sometimes it's just like a platform with a little screen around it, and, uh, and then they have these nice walking paths with big bamboo on both sides that keep it from getting washed away during the rainy season. So you just have an earthen path that may be 25 to 40 feet long and you just walk back and forth. And it's really nice because then you don't have to think. And if you get distracted by the time you get to the end of the walking lane and you're standing there, you realize the mind's been thinking and then you get to start over. Oh yeah, thinking is like this. Turning is like this. And you're just noticing what's being known. Standing is like this. Stepping, stepping, right, left. And you don't have to mentally note, but you can use the mental noting when your mind is more all over the place, distracted, then just ask your mind in a gentle, loving way, just mentally note or label what the mind is knowing. It takes work, but it will keep the mind from zooming off and fantasizing and problem solving and thinking about the future and thinking about the past because it's got to mentally note what's being known. Oh, seeing's being known or hearing's being known or stepping, 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 standing, 
standing, turning, turning, <laughs> stepping, step right. So just that, and it, it you basically, that there's going to be pushback, but we're training the mind to be in the present moment. So let's sit down because now we're going to, for one of the classic sitting techniques, although you can use it really any time of the day, but it's often taught in the context of sitting meditation is mindfulness of the breathing. And even once the Buddha had deep awakening, was a, a wise guy, a, one of the enlightened sages, he still did mindfulness of breathing practice. He'd call it, you know, happiness here and now. Like just to, there's some basic pleasure. In Buddhism, we call it seclusion, mental seclusion. But, you know, I mentioned we experience the world through the six sense gates and it's constant impingement, constant sounds constant motions to detect, constant thoughts to notice. It's never ending. We're exposed to this like endless stream of sense experience. So, but we have this capacity to radically simplify our experience by choosing to pay attention to one thing. And generally we choose something neutral, ordinary, and the breath is actually perfectly designed because it has some movement to it. So it's not too boring, to, but it takes a little work because it, the tendency is to want to control it. So to be alert, but also just allowing the breath to be. So let's do that for a few minutes, maybe about 15 minutes. I'll walk us through it. So just sit comfortably. I'll talk more about posture next week, but just see if what for your body is both alert upright and relaxed. So we want to equally emphasize the relaxation and the uprightness in the posture and see what that is like for you. And after you've made the necessary adjustments, just do your best to hold relatively still. You might start by just taking a couple of longer, deeper breaths in a relaxed way, just fill and then empty the lungs a couple of times. And feel your whole body as you fill the lungs and feel the whole body as you empty the lungs. And let's do that one more time. And whenever you're finished, just let the breathing continue on its own. So we're not trying to make the breath any particular way. So just establishing mindfulness to the fore, this present moment awareness, this receptive observing sensitivity. And as the breath comes in, just notice the normal sensations of breathing in from the beginning to the end of the in-breath. And then as the out-breath begins, the ordinary out-breath, just notice the ordinary sensations of breathing out from the beginning to the end. And for some of you, it might be feeling, sensing that at the nostrils, other people find it more easy to feel as a rising and falling of the abdominal wall. But wherever the movement or sensations of the breath are most clear to you, that will do. And if you need to make a mental note, then you could use something like, Breathing in is like this. Breathing out is like this. Or you could use just the single word in, out. But you don't have to use any words. The basic task 
is to connect and sustain awareness with the breathing process. Breathing in is being known. Breathing out is being known. And feel successful if we can track an in-breath from the beginning to the end in this relaxed and alert way, that's real success. And then the out-breath from the beginning to the end. And we're not controlling, we don't really have any agenda about how the breath goes. It's just about the continuity of awareness. And whenever you catch yourself lost in thought, be really friendly about distraction. Oh, honey, that's how it goes. Lost in thought. Okay. Sittings like this, feeling the whole body. Breathing in is being known. Breathing out is being known. And be happy when you catch yourself having been distracted because it means that you're already back to present moment awareness. Otherwise you wouldn't have recognized that you were lost in thought. See if you can sense that simple pleasure of being present in this relaxed, curious way. It feels good. Light, sense of wholeness. We call it the pleasure of seclusion. We're just tracking 
the ordinary flow of sensation of the in and out breath and aware that this is being known or this is being felt, it's like this now. And allow the breath to become as subtle or quiet or even as it does, as, as it wants to. We're just trusting the body to do the breathing. And for this period of time, another four minutes or so, it's really okay to put everything else down. It's quite a gift that all we need to do is be aware of breathing in, be aware of breathing out. Breathing in is being known, being felt. Breathing out is being known and felt. And it's okay if you prefer to be aware of the whole body. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. 
breathing out, allowing the body to be. So you can use a more whole body awareness with this practice, or you can have a more specific attention to the movement of the breath itself. And now let go of this exclusive attention to the breath or the body and allow the eyes to open, but just gazing to the floor and for a few more seconds, just being aware of whatever's predominant. You could even just check on the six sense gates for a moment, each one. Hearing is being known, and then just be aware of that simple experience of hearing. Touching, being known. Seeing, visual experience, being known, being seen. Smelling and tasting to whatever degree, notice its neutrality. And then of course, mental activity being known. Often the mind gets really quiet when we start being curious about mental activity. And then all together, it's like this now. We just notice how trustworthy present moment awareness is. Relaxed and alert. And you might even feel some gratitude about the teachings and the practice and the capacity to be present. It's really human common sense to want to be present. So oh, adjust the body a little bit. Just a few minutes left. Anybody get some continuity with the mindfulness of breathing? It's a real important step and you have to look, if you don't look, you won't find, but to correlate the continuity of present moment awareness with a wholesome pleasure in the heart and mind, because that creates the feedback loop. If you don't 
make the effort to be curious about that. It's really the gathering of the heart and mind. It unifies, it gathers, and it feels good. It's like a healing for the heart and mind. And when the mind's scattered and dissipated and superficial, well, we know what that feels like. That's a good. But when the mind isn't fragmented, but is whole, it feels good. It feels light, it feels enlivened, and it feels peaceful. It feels good. And you really want to notice that because it will keep you coming back. Like, oh yeah, this is a good thing to do. I don't need the Buddha to tell me this is a good thing to do. I see, feel directly my own experience is a good thing to do. So look for that pleasure, even though it may not be easy, even though you may not get a lot of that continuity, whenever you get a little continuity, it will feel a little good. And when you get more of that continuity, it will feel better. And not to get greedy, because if you get greedy, you'll lose the continuity. You have to be relaxed and alert, not greedy and alert, <laughs> it will work. <laughs> So it, it trains, it teases out all the bad habits because bad habits don't work. Only good habits work, which is why it's such a great practice. Last thing I need to say is come next Tuesday night, you won't want to come on Zoom or you won't want to get in your car and come, even though you might feel like this is a great thing. I'm really into mindfulness. I want to do it. Does it make sense to have a human life and be unmindful? But when push comes to shove, my favorite show's on Tuesday night, or I'm exhausted from work, or... But, but the thing is, if you don't give yourself at least six weeks, you're not gonna know how valuable it is. The same teacher that I mentioned before, Saito Uteshinia, he said the thing that really breaks his heart is that if people only knew the value of cultivating mindful awareness, they would make the effort to do it but they don't know. So they don't make the effort and they lose that opportunity to really turn, you know, really improve their lives in all sorts of little and big ways. It really is life transforming. And the thing is, if resistance comes, cause we had a hard day and we're tired or whatever it might be, not, don't wanna get back on Zoom, don't wanna drive over to the center. And remember, you can always do it on Zoom, the people who are here, you don't have to, and people on, at home, you can come here, so it's fluid. But we have that opportunity just to feel what it feels like to be resistant. Oh, resistance feels like this. Not wanting to go to Common Ground or not wanting to turn Zoom on, it feels like this. This is something being known. And we make peace with that experience. Oh, this is something being known. And once we make peace with it, we don't have to avoid it because we're already found a way to be alert and relaxed with whatever we didn't want to feel. Like the idea of getting on Zoom feels like this. Oh, that's a yucky feeling. It feels like this. It's just that thing being known. Okay. Well, I've already felt that. I might as well get on Zoom, right? It's, I know it sounds funny, but, and we'll talk more about this in the weeks ahead, but there is something powerfully disarming about being willing to feel what we don't want to feel. It gives so many more options to life when we learn not to be afraid of what we're feeling. Just so you know, there's a sit going on. Oh, let's see. Oh, no, it's over. So you can be noisy in the lobby. So all you at on Zoom, see you next Tuesday night. And all you in the room, have a great week of practice, everyone. And I've recorded this. I'll send it out maybe tomorrow. So you could use some of the guided meditations if you need that. And of course, we have lots of guided meditations. Um, all our recorded programs are on the, our YouTube page. And also you can find them on our website. All the audio are on the website. Otherwise, go to YouTube and just search for Common Ground Meditation Center. And we have all our stuff there in the video form. See you next week, everyone. Thanks for coming.